Okay. How many of you have ever gone kite flying? Raise your hands. Isn't it fun? So let me ask you, besides the kite, of course, and yourself, what do you need to fly a kite? Oh, yeah, you need string. You need string, obviously, yeah. But uh, I heard somebody said over here, you need what? You need wind to fly a kite. When I was a kid, I haven't flown a kite forever. Anybody fly a kite within the last year at all? Here in Arizona where there's lots of wind? <laughs> It's been a long time since I've flown a kite, but um, I used to have fun flying a kite when I was a kid. We go to the park, and I just run as fast as I can, you know, get that kite going. Especially, obviously, there has to be wind. But there was a particular park we used to go to, um, Eagle Rock Park in Eagle Rock, California. You've been there, Vicki? Eagle Rock Park? Really? Interesting. Okay, well, we can have a long conversation about Eagle Rock. But uh, in the Eagle Rock Park, there was, uh, you know, you had all of the grass, but there were some hills, small hills with uh, trees, and uh, my brother and I used to have the start up the top and then run down the hill um, so the kite can sort of get a, I don't know, maybe a 40-foot head start was the height of the hill. And uh, it was just a lot of fun, and we just let out as much string as you can go, as much as much string as you can go. Now, you do need wind to fly a kite. So as you can see the picture on the screen, here's a, here's a boy wanting to fly a kite, waiting for the wind, and this is what he gets. Now, can you imagine flying a kite in a tornado? Is that too much wind? It's a little bit too much wind. You don't want to fly a kite when a tornado is about to hit. And, you know, the reason why I'm using this illustration is because we are talking about the Holy Spirit for the next eight weeks or after this for the next six weeks. And the Holy Spirit is much like this. Now, if you open up your lesson guide, does everybody have a lesson guide? Okay. No? Raise your hand if you did not get a guide. Raise your hand if you did not get one. Okay. It looks like, thank you, Marianne, it looks like everybody did get one. It says there at the top paragraph on the left-hand side, the Holy Spirit is a proactive being and can instruct, inspire, and convict and empower anyone to live the life that is honorable to God. But how much can we expect when we ask for the Holy Spirit? Just enough to get by? The Holy Spirit will always meet and even exceed our hopes. That's kind of what I want to illustrate in this tornado. When we pray for the Holy Spirit to inspire us, to illuminate us, to empower us, uh, to bring the grace of Jesus in our lives, do we pray for a tornado or are we praying for a slight breeze? Do we pray for just enough to get by or are we asking God, God, give me all you've got. Give me all you've got, God. And it's kind of when we are asking God for the outpouring of, Holy, of, of His Holy Spirit in our lives, how much do you really want? How much do I really want of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps in the back of our minds, we know that change will take place. And so I don't want my kite to just go and get lost up in the universe in a whirlwind. I just want enough for 20 feet high, that's all. How much do we want of God really in our lives through the agency of his spirit? God, the grace of Jesus comes through us through the Holy Spirit. How much do we really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, we're going to talk about that today. I wanted to start off with that illustration. Just a recap from last week. A 60-second recap, um, we talked about the Holy Spirit as far as who is the Holy Spirit. If you didn't get a lesson, by the way, last week or this week, you can go on our website and you can download uh, these in the form of a PDF. But last week, we looked at the triune God concept, this concept that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this is the God family expressed in those three unique individual uh, beings. And we call that the triune God or the Trinity or the Godhead. 
And we looked at the Holy Spirit as a person and as a deity. That's what we looked at last week. The Holy Spirit is a person <clears throat> and a deity. So we wanted to start off with that before we launched out in the rest of this thing. Things. Okay, today I'm going to do, do a recap of what we're going to share today and I'll repeat it at the end of this service. So this is where we're going to look at today. You got to hold on to your seats because the Holy Spirit may bring some powerful conviction to your hearts today through his word. He does to me. And it's not me that's doing this. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is what we're going to look at today. The work or the mission of the Holy Spirit. And these are your main points in your lesson, those Roman numeral points. We're going to look at the Holy Spirit's mission in the world today. What is the Holy Spirit doing? What is he about? Secondly, we're going to look at the Apostle Paul's understanding of the function of the law. When I say the law, I'm talking about what? The Ten Commandments. <clears throat> so we're going to look at Paul's understanding of the function of the law and of the inner or the spiritual tension that exists, exists in those regenerated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're going to share Paul's theology of how we relate to the law. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky to understand. Uh, and once you understand it, though, you will say, yes, yes, Paul, I understand what you're saying. And I get it because this is how this is my experience. This is my personal experience. There's a tension there, and all of this tension is, is described by Paul in the book of Romans chapter 7, to be exact. We're going to look at that. Then uh, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit power available to anyone who lists in this battle against self, this battle against temptation, no matter who you are, how old you are. And then lastly, the provision that God supplies for us through his Holy Spirit. That last one, what the Holy Spirit can do for us and in us by God's grace and love, if it weren't for this, this last one, the other three, especially Romans chapter 7, we can understand that. And uh, How many of you say we need God's grace in our lives? We need the grace of God. We need His mercy. It's like that parable that Jesus told where there's this very religious man called the Pharisee and there's this guy that just he knows his track record is all messed up he's got a bad track record he cannot bring any credentials to God and saying you see who I am he realizes that Jesus tells a parable and this guy who realizes his emptiness his destituteness his his lack of holiness in him all he does is pray what? What is he's hitting his chest? He doesn't even look up to God when he's praying. And what does he say? God be merciful, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And, and Jesus' parable, which usually teach moral lessons, Jesus says, that guy, instead of all the religious one who was full of self-accolades and presenting himself to God as one who deserves all this and that, says that's the one that went away okay by God. God was okay with that guy. Not okay with his sins, but okay with his attitude. God could work with people like that. People who realize their brokenness and their need of God. God could work with people like that, right? It's very hard even for the almighty, all-powerful God to try and mold a human heart that is hard of self-admiration. Very hard for even God to work with somebody like that. That was the parable of Jesus. So this last part on the flip side of your guide lesson, that is very, very important. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to look at some things this morning in your lesson. Number one, the Holy Spirit's mission to the world. The Holy Spirit's mission to the world. If you're at home, if you're watching, again, you can go on ad, uh, tempeadventist.com, tempeadventist.com, and you can download this uh, lesson guide PDF. I don't know if you can watch it simultaneously by watching this, this, uh, this presentation. 
So, um, but you can do that. All right. The Holy Spirit's mission to the world. Let's look at this text here. John chapter 16. It's on the screen for you. Verses 8 through 11. This is what the Apostle John says. And he, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and what else? And judgment. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. I think I said John. It's in John. This is Jesus speaking. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. It's also in your lesson. This is what Jesus is saying the mission of the Holy Spirit, okay? So there are three things that the Holy Spirit convicts the human heart of. And now don't take this as something that's just on the screen, that's something that's on paper in the Bible. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you personally. This is for you. This is for you who are watching. This is for me. What three things does the Holy Spirit bring conviction to you and you and me about? So, number one, what was the first one? Sin. Because this is unbelief. Unbelief is sin. That's what Jesus said. And sin must be identified before it is, what? Treated, right? We talked about the unfortunate cases of some of our members who have cancer. Well, you're never going to get treated for an ailment if you don't first feel, that's the marvelous thing about our bodies. When your bodies are aching somehow, those are signals that God had designed in the body that something's wrong, something's up in your body. And so pain in those cases is a good thing. You put your finger over, a you know, everybody's lighting firecrackers, you know, nowadays, tonight, today, tomorrow, they're going to light things. You put your hand on a cherry bomb. Don't buy cherry bombs. Those are illegal, right? But imagine, when I was a kid, I had a firecracker. I was telling my nephew, the firecrackers, when I was a kid, they were about this long. Do you remember? They were the red ones, those red firecrackers. They were about this long, and the fuse was about that long. Now they're little sissy firecrackers, I was telling you. <laughs> they're only that long, and they're less powerful nowadays. But I had one of those firecrackers blow up in my hand accidentally. It... I thought I blew my hand off. It hurt. Now that pain was a good thing because do you think I did it again? <laughs> that pain tells you don't do it again. It's going to hurt. And so it must, sin must be identified before being treated. And this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit will come and go for your jugular and say, this is wrong. In your conscience, this isn't right. This is wrong. This is sinful. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And then number two, the Holy Spirit convicts us of what? Righteousness. Of righteousness because Jesus will return to heaven vindicating his claim as God's pure and holy son. If Jesus were to lose the battle against Satan here on planet earth, if he were to, he was hungry after 40 days of fasting, and the devil told him, he says, you know, you can do anything you want. You can turn this stone into a, a loaf of bread. Ten grain bread. Imagine, Jesus. Ten grain. I'll even provide a toaster and butter for you. Jesus was starving. Now imagine if Jesus would have succumbed to that temptation. That would have proved that the power of evil and maliciousness and the devil was more powerful than divinity, than the power of Christ himself. It would have proved Jesus would have lost. Therefore, Jesus wouldn't have been righteous. He wouldn't have proved himself holy and godly and just perfect as the driven snow. And so the Holy Spirit convicts you that Jesus is righteous. He's pure. He's holy. And Jesus proved that by beating the devil and being resurrected and going to heaven, and therefore he was God's pure and holy son. The Holy Spirit affirms this and convicts us of our need to receive Christ's purity, <coughs> purity or his righteousness. Yes, can you do me a favor? I left my uh, bottle of water in my office. Can you get that for me, please? Thank you. 
<clears throat> and then the third one that the Holy Spirit convicts us of is what? What's the third thing? Judgment. It's judgment. Because the Holy Spirit exposes Satan's malevolence and reminds us that only through Christ can we be acquitted in the final judgment. Thank you. So this judgment, it's a, it's a, it's a double header. It's a double whammy. Because Christ, because he has been vindicated as righteous, the devil has been judged as fallen. His plan is kaput. He's got his future in the lake of fire. Um, he has been proven wrong at the cross, etc., etc. So it's a judgment against the devil. But also, if we are with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will judge us as acquitted. And that's what your lesson says. If you look at the bottom part with those uh, arrows, sin is the problem. The problem is an unbelieving heart. Righteousness, the solution is Jesus Christ as righteousness. And judgment, the verdict is that we are acquitted. And I put in my lesson, acquitted for believers or acquittal for believers. You can add those words for believers. Believers are acquitted of the condemnation judgment, the judgment of condemnation. So this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. Okay? This is his mission to the world. It's a nonstop, 24-7, 365 day a week mission. The Holy Spirit is busy. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is busy speaking to your heart, speaking to your conscience, speaking to my conscience. He's very busy. He's got his work cut out for him, right? So that is the Holy Spirit's mission in our world today. The second one. This one <clears throat> is where it gets to feel a little bit uncomfortable. This is where Paul's assessment of the self is right on target. Now, some people may... Some people may feel comfortable of their spirituality. <clears throat> Some people may feel cozy in the things that they believe in and how they're living their lives. If you have the approval of God in your conscience, great. <clears throat> if you don't, then it's not so great. But this next section describes the tension that we all experience. This is a very, very... A real tension. I want to start off <clears throat> by reading Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. Paul gives a marriage illustration. This is what he says. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law. So he's not speaking to Gentiles. He's not speaking to uh, unbelievers or unchurched. He's speaking to those who know about the law. You guys know this stuff. That's what he's saying. I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives, correct? And then this is the illustration he gives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called what? An adulteress. And this goes both ways, obviously. If a man still has a wife and he's joined to another woman, he shall be called an adulterer. Um, but if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Correct? <clears throat> That's pretty, pretty clear reasoning that Paul is saying. Now, I want to clarify a couple of things in this one here. That Paul is not, and I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, Paul is not saying that when the husband dies in this illustration, that marriage laws are erased wholesale, completely. That's not what he's saying. Because when the woman gets married again, what happens to marriage laws if a, if a woman or a man were to get married again? What? They apply. So Paul is not just saying, the marriage laws, once the husband dies, marriage laws are done. 
She can go marry five men if she wants. She can go marry a man and she can go with another man while she's... That's not what he's saying, obviously. I think we all understand that. Marriage laws still apply, but Paul's point here is that when a spouse dies, you are no longer obligated to be faithful and loyal to that spouse because that spouse is dead. Now, don't misunderstand Paul. He's not saying you have to get remarried. That's not what he's saying, right? Because there are certain people that I don't want to get remarried. There's others that are, will remain faithful and loyal to their deceased spouse in the sense that I can never get married again. I'll never find a man like him. I'll never find a woman like her. Or I just, I don't want to get married. I just, you know, we are married for, I understand that. And I think Paul understands that too. That's not his point. His simple point is, you are permitted to get married again if you so desire. That's the point he is making here, right? So you are dead in the sense that if you want to get married again because you're lonely, you still want companionship, and people do this all the time. People get remarried when a spouse dies. It happens all the time. Because perhaps they just they need that companionship. There's a need for that companionship. <clears throat> but don't feel that if you want that companionship, oh no, I think it's wrong because I was married before even though my spouse is dead. Paul is saying, no, you're free to remarry. It's okay. It's okay to remarry if you so desire. That's the simple point. So <clears throat> being free from the law, free from the law, look at your lesson in letter A. In this illustration, being free from the law does not annul marriage laws wholesale but that circumstances change the relation of things. Your circumstances change your relationship. You're no longer obliged to remain unmarried because you were married before even though he's... No, you can remain. It changes your relation. Now you can have a new relationship if you want. You can have a new relationship, but marriage laws still apply. Death of a spouse, the circumstances, now permits the surviving spouse a new one, which is a new relationship. And the new pair are ob obligated to their vows. They're obligated to their vows. Now, what is Paul's point in this illustration? We're going to go to uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. And this is the point he's making about this illustration. Let's read the Bible. It's there on the screen. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made... When, in fact, when he says this word, therefore, that is a, a word that attaches what he's going to say to what was just said before in Romans chapter 7, the first three verses. Therefore, all of you guys are here. Uh, the church isn't as crowded as it was before because of the virus. And, you know, but there are you here. Therefore, even though you're not all here, I'm glad. Therefore, it's connecting to what I said earlier. So this is what Paul is saying. Therefore, you guys, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another. That's why I use that marriage illustration. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, what does that mean? Anybody take a guess what that means? While you're in the flesh. Well, it doesn't mean alive, because we're, we're always alive. Unbelievers are alive. Believers are alive. What was that? Yes. So while we were living in our sinful nature, while we, while we were unenlightened and being very carnal about our lifestyles, that's what he's saying. While we were still in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now, he says, we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound. I know this sounds like confusing language, so we'll explain this. So that we serve in newness of what? The what? Say it again. I can't hear you. <laughs> The Spirit. We serve in newness of the Spirit and not in what? Oldness of the letter. 
if my spouse were to die, God forbid, Elisa, <laughs> if my spouse were to die, I can start a new relationship if I wanted to, right? Paul is saying you are dead to the law so that now you can serve in newness of the spirit. You're married to somebody else, Jesus, and you don't serve in the, what does he say? In the oldness of the letter. So this is what this means. And here I'm going to, you're going to go to your, your lesson for this. Dying to the law, which he says in verse four, or being released from it in verse six, does not mean that the law dies, but that we die to it. This is very important to understand. We die to it. Stop being married to the law. Look at what it says here on the screen. What does it say? Say it louder with me, everybody together. As a means of salvation, which is what? Legalism. This was the constant... This is the constant uh, preaching that, I mean, Paul preached this over and over and over again to Jewish believers. He had to say it over. He had to be repetitive uh, until he was a broken record. This was the problem of the first century Christians, Jews that were converted to Jesus Christ. That if you depend on your own obedience to the law, then that'll make you saved. Now let me ask you a question uh, at this point. How many of you have ever prayed this prayer before? And I would like to see a show of hands when I open my eyes, because I'm going to pray this prayer, and I'm asking if you've ever done this before. Oh, Ten Commandments, please Change my heart, Ten Commandments. Live in me. Help me, Ten Commandments, to obey you perfectly. Perfectly. In the name of the Ten Commandments, amen. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer before? Nobody? How, how do your prayers, who are your prayers addressed to? What do you usually pray for? How do you pray? How can I adjust and reword that prayer? My Father, who art in heaven, what else should I say? Hallowed be thy name. God, please help me to, to love you. Help me to serve you. Help me to walk in your light. Help me to obey your law. But who am I addressing my prayer to? I am praying, and I'm jumping ahead of myself because we're going to see this at the end. I am praying to a person to help me and change me am i not and the problem with first uh, first century judaism was that they were looking at their own credentials oh i didn't do this i didn't do that look at me my my record's pretty clean i didn't say a bad word today i didn't say not one bad word today yes that card is like a scorecard look at me god I didn't have one adulterous relationship for the last seven years. Not one adulterous relationship. You can check it. I didn't carouse with this guy. I didn't carouse with this girl. I've been faithful to my spouse. I haven't walked or talked with somebody in an improper way. I haven't committed adultery. Look at this. So the problem was that you look at your own accomplishments, your own obedience, and you present that to God, and I'm okay. God must approve of that. That's wrong. Paul is saying that that's like being married to the law. And that is legalism. That is legalism. It's going to become clearer as we go on into this chapter. So here is the law's role, that is letter B in your lesson. Let's look at the law's role. This is going to come clear as we go along. All right. Number one in Romans, I want to read this for you. You can open your Bibles or your phones. Go to Romans chapter 7 and look at verses uh, 14 
through 20, actually no, Romans 7 and verse 7. Romans 7 and verse 7. And this is what the Bible says. I'm going to read, uh, starting with verse 7. And it says here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. So he's saying, just in case you're, you, you commit a mistake, he's saying, I'm not saying that the law is bad. He says, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting, coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. By the, by the way, that's the commandment that's probably the most challenging because that is the commandment that strikes at your inner motives and intentions, coveting. The others have to do with outward things, inward obviously, but verse 8, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. In other words, when I realized about the law in its, in its full sense, not just superficial, but the realm of thoughts and motives and intentions. When I was aware of that, he says, I died because I realized sin is in me. I thought I was alive, but now I realize how messed up I am. And that's what Paul is saying. I died because of the law. Awareness. And then verse 11, for sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Verse 13, therefore did that which is good, in other words, the law, become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, he says. It was sin. So he's not saying the law is bad. In fact, quite the opposite. The law exposes sin. That's number one. In your lesson, the law exposes sin. Correspondingly, because it exposes sins, the law is holy, what? Righteous and good. Why is it holy and righteous and good? Because of what it reveals. That's why we said earlier, if you don't identify the problem, you're messed up. If you don't identify the problem, then how are you ever going to fix it? And this is what the law does. It makes you aware of the problem. Faith does not nullify the law. We still uphold it. We still uphold the law. Now, it's kind of like Paul is saying this. You know, I like to speed. Anybody here like to speed? Nobody wants to raise their hand, right? <laughs> So I'm a fast driver. I'll admit that. It's not my fault though because I was born with my right foot. It's heavier than my left foot. My right foot is about five pounds heavier than my left foot. So it's not my fault. It just happens to be a heavy foot. But uh, I, I like to drive fast. I have to be careful. So let's say you love to drive fast, okay? And you just zoom here on Apache Boulevard in front of our church here. You zoom through Apache right now because they put that trolley, those trolley tracks in. You know, traffic is going to go slower once those trolleys start, you know, running. But let's say you're going down Apache Boulevard at 65 miles an hour. <laughs> Somebody just said yes. <laughs> at 65 miles an hour. And that's just you. You like to speak. You want to see how fast you can beat the light. You want to beat the yellow. You just want to see how fast you can go. You challenge yourself. You're going 65 miles an hour. And then let's say, just for illustration's sake, these signs are put up that say, what is it, 35 miles an hour? Let's say signs are all of a sudden put up. 35 miles an hour. Now that law didn't exist before, did it? So really, you're not doing anything wrong at traveling at 65 or 75 miles an hour, right? Because you like to speed, even though the street is narrow and it's not safe. It's not safe to go that fast. But there was no law. But now that there's a law that says 35 miles an hour, is that law going to prevent you from driving 65 miles an hour? I'm going to get different answers here. Yes or no? It should. It should. But here's what you're going to realize. Now it's illegal to drive 65 miles an hour. 
Now you're aware of what you're doing is wrong. Now you're aware of it. And if you keep on doing it, you're going to pay the consequences. But if you are a speeder and you go 90 on the freeway, 120 on the freeway, and you have, you're forced to slow down here on Patchy Boulevard because of that dumb 35 mile per hour zone sign. Does that sign change your attitude in your heart? Or does it just prevent an action of you pressing down on that accelerator? Which one? It probably just prevents the action, doesn't it? It's not going to change you into a slow driver now. Oh, oh, the 35 mile, oh, I feel changed all of a sudden. Now, I don't like to speed. In fact, I hate speeding. Oh, I enjoy driving slow now. I'm just a changed person. Oh, I love those speed limits. Is that what happens? No. Likewise, we're going to go into this next section, uh, this one. The law's role, it only, I already said this, it exposes sin. It does not change you. Let's go to the next one. Our dual natures and the inner war. Okay, number one. Um, let's go ahead and read again, starting with verse 14. You're in Romans chapter 7. I'm telling you, I hate these verses. Now, oh, you know what I mean, don't you? Don't really hate them, but they bug me. These verses bug me. And they're going to bug you too, because this is what Paul says. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of what? Flesh sold into bondage to sin. Does that mean Paul was the worst sinner and he was just a hypocrite? And everything he preached to people all over the world didn't really apply to him because he was a hypocrite? Is that what he's saying? Let's keep on reading. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. What? Are you, are you schizophrenic? <laughs> are you excusing yourself, Paul? Oh, it's not me doing it. It's just sin doing it in me. Is that what Paul is saying? So now, uh, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, in my fallen nature. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. You ever hear that saying? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know down deep inside what to do. You want to do good. You want to do what is right. You know down deep in your heart. If you admit it and you're brutally honest with yourself, you know what the right thing to do is. Then how come you don't do it? How come you don't do it? What's your problem, man? You know what's right. You know the right thing to think. You know the right thing to say. You know the right thing to do. You know the right attitude you should have. I'm talking to believers now. You know these things. You know what the law says. You know what is right. Then why don't you do it? How come? Are you just a hypocrite? Are you messed up? Are you a fake? Why don't you just leave the church then? Just leave. If you don't do what you know what is right, then what's your problem? Anybody here have a problem? Paul is saying all of us have that problem. That's what he's saying. We all have this tension in us that we know what is right. The Holy Spirit speaks to us God's law. The Holy Spirit speaks to our consciences. We know what we ought to do. We know how we ought to think. We know that these thoughts aren't right. Then why do you do it? It's that tension that he's explaining here. His theology, what I call the theology of the self. This pool. You're pulled one way. The good. The good is pulling you. But you also have something else pulling you. You have the bad. And that's why at the end of the day, if something happens, oh God, I know I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, God. 
and you start crying. Please forgive me, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have. I know I shouldn't have. I knew it, but I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me of my sins. Please forgive me. It's that tension that exists. That's why this chapter bugs me. Let's read on. Verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is present in me. Evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good. Evil is present in me. Me, the one that wants to do good. And he says, verse 23, but I see a different law in the members of my body, whether it's the tongue or your hands or your feet that lead you to a place that you shouldn't go or your hands that lead you to do something that you shouldn't do or your eyes that lead you to see something that you shouldn't be seeing or your tongue that leads you to say something that you regret later, the members of your body. He says, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He said, ah, I hate this about me. There's this tension in me. I'm wretched. What do I do? Ah. You ever feel that way before? You want to do good, but you don't do it. And you knew afterwards you regret it because you didn't do the good that you wanted to do. You ever feel that way before? I have. <gasps> the pastor? Everybody. We have this pool. Now, in some people, the pool in the good direction or the wrong direction, it, it varies with individuals. Something may pull you in the wrong direction. Now, for me, ugh, I have no problem with it. I'm never going to pull that way. It's, that's just not my thing. That's not my temptation. That's not my weakness. And others are pulled and are very strong in this, while others are not so strong, and they struggle with that. That's why we have to be patient with each other. Amen? We have to be patient with each other, and Jesus said it perfectly. He always says things perfectly. He said it this way. <clears throat> I, I'm pretty sure Jesus would say something like this if he were up here. I'm pretty sure he would say this. All you guys are in the same boat. And so don't be too hard on other people. I'm sure Jesus would say something like that. But this is the way he said it. Don't look at the speck of dust in your brother or sister's eye when you yourself have a big 12-foot 2x4 stud in your own eye. That's what he's saying. Right? That's what he said. Don't be so judgmental and condemning of another person that does these bad things when it's not your deal, or when it's not your weakness, but hey, buddy, Jesus will say, you have your own weaknesses, and you know them well. So don't be too hard on somebody else. You better look at yourself first before you pretend to be judgmental and condemning and be the perfect judge towards somebody else. That's what Jesus says, right? So this, going back to Paul, this is the uh, tension. So Paul acknowledges, this is our dual natures in the inner world. Paul acknowledges very strong opposing forces in ourselves. One that desires to what? Obey God's law. This is your guide now. And an other force that desires to what? To sin. Now, we're talking about the Holy Spirit and what, the, the, what this guide is entitled, a power available. We started out by saying the Holy Spirit's mission in the world to convict us, to guide us. We started out what his mission is. Now, now we talked about ourselves, this pool, this tension that exists within ourselves. And by the way, earlier I said some words, schizophrenia. Paul is not being schizophrenic. He is not excusing any sin like, well, like earlier he said, well, now I acknowledge that it's not really me doing it, but sin in me. He's not excusing sin with that phrase. What he is saying is that in his inner, the law of his mind, he said that, <clears throat> in the law of his mind, in your deep, as a believer, in your deep inner heart of hearts, 
Don't you want to be like Jesus? Raise your hands if you want to be like Jesus. And way deep down inside, don't you want to be like Jesus? Now raise your hands if you are perfectly reflecting Jesus in every possible way in your life. I'm talking in literal terms. So what Paul is saying is, down deep, I want you to do good. I want to be like Jesus. I want to follow him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that I have this pull in me. Now here is something that we need to understand. Because we talk about being reborn again. Anybody ever hear about that term, rebirth, being reborn again? Okay. In order for you and I to make it into God's kingdom, in order for us to go to heaven, you want to go to heaven? You have to have a change of heart. That's what's called the rebirth. You have to re be, be reborn again. And that is affected by the Holy Spirit. Jesus clearly says this. You have to be born of water and the Spirit. He says this in John chapter 3. You have to be reborn again. Oh, it's not just, oh, I have new plans, I have new goals. Uh, no, it has to be a natural rebirth. But surprise, surprise, if you have been reborn again, I guarantee you what Paul is saying here, the day that you were reborn or that slow process of rebirth that did not get rid of your old nature. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sinning, right? You wouldn't commit sin, never. So what's the deal? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, we are new creatures. The old has gone, the new has come. That's what Paul says. The same Paul. Is he speaking out of both sides of his mouth? No. The new creatures is that you have been infused with the Holy Spirit. You have a power to overcome. Jesus can come into your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a power to overcome. You have a power to resist. You are now on new ground. You are on a new team. You have new power. You're on the winning side. You have a new power that you did not have before. You have a new awareness and realization through the Holy Spirit that you didn't have before. This was Paul's problem as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He said it right here. He said, before the law, I wasn't aware of covenant. But when the law revived, when, the, when I was aware of the law, sin revived and I died. Now, how can Paul, who knew the law back and forth and memorized it, how could he say, well, when I came to know the law, sin revived and I died? He already knew the law. When you know the law on a spiritual level, because earlier I said, use illustrations. Has anybody ever literally stole something? Don't raise your hand. When I was a kid, I stole something. Has anybody ever stole something, literally? A car, a toy, a spouse. If you've ever literally stole something, that's wrong. But you don't have to literally steal something for you to steal something. You know what I mean? You can steal it in here. That's why I said earlier, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Oh, man. That commandment goes for your jugular because it's talking about your thoughts and what you want in here, what, what's going on in here. You can steal in here and not commit the physical act. You can adulterize, if that's a word, in here and in here and not commit the actual act. And this is what Paul means. I became aware of a deeper sense of the law and oh man, I realize how messed up I am. That's what he's saying. Why? Because before, as a Pharisee of Pharisees, he was married to the law. Look at the good things that I've done. He was looking at his own credentials. God, look at this. Perfect obedience to the law. He was married to the law. Now I'm going to be saved. I know I'm going to be saved because look at my perfect obedience to the law. He wasn't obeying it perfectly. He got a deeper sense of the law of how it works on the inside, the spiritual sense. And he says, oh my goodness, I messed up. I just didn't realize this. I need Jesus. I need grace. Look at the, where it has the eyeballs in your lesson. The law of God is perfect, exposing sin. Read it with me out loud but cannot 
change a wayward heart. It does not have that function or power. The Ten Commandments do not change you. The Ten Commandments do not transform you. They inform you. The Ten Commandments inform us, but they do not transform us. It is impossible for you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy, etc., etc., etc. It is impossible that those words can change your heart. That's not the function of the law. And it doesn't have that power. And that leads us to this one. The power to change through the Holy Spirit. i got to speed up here. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 5 on the screen. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that's change you. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, because we're sinful beings and we're broken people, and the law cannot fix a broken heart. Impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. But God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he became carnal, human as we are, not sinful. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in his physical body, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. You see, Paul is saying the law hasn't been done away with. Those marriage laws haven't been done away with. Once a woman or a man gets remarried, they're still obligated to obey the marriage laws if they get married again. Who do not walk according to what? The flesh, but what? Walk according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. This, 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 this is that tension. This is the, this is the, the, where the rubber meets the road in Christianity. Your thoughts, your motives, your intentions. Who cares if you've never committed this or that physically or observably? Who cares? Who gives a rip? What do you think inside? What are your thoughts like? What are your motives and intentions like? That's the realm of God's judgment. God penetrates and he sees everything behind the words and behind the actions. He penetrates everything in us it's very uncomfortable it's very uncomfortable we are completely naked and exposed before god you cannot hide any thought before god oh man i feel like killing this person who cut me off Ugh. and then you're mad for 15 minutes oh man and if you could have you would have cut that person off the same thing just whomp, boom. But you couldn't because there was a semi there and there was another car driving slow over here. Ah! And you were dying to cut off that person again. But you didn't cut off that person. So God will say, I'm so glad you didn't cut off that person. I'm so glad. Good for you. You think God's going to say that? He's going to say, I know what you're thinking. You cut off that person in your heart, didn't you? So this inner workings of Christianity that Paul describes, I hate it. Because it's bringing truth to light. It's uncomfortable. But here's the power. Here's the power. Not everything is bad news. Because Paul says this, the spirit of life set me free. I'm not going to be married to the law, depend on the law to change me. I've got a person to change me. I've got the grace of Jesus Christ to change me. That's what Paul is saying. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, here on the screen. But I say, walk by what? The Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We're talking about a power available this morning. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit, or by the Spirit? It means we have to constantly be praying, Lord, Help me to walk according to your ways. Help me to walk according to your will. Well, the will is the Bible, and the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit, so it's synonymous. Help me, God, to walk by your Spirit. When you're tempted, you pray. 
God, please. I don't want to have this thought. Please, God, help me, God. And you have to, that prayer has to be real. I mean, it's, it's got to be real for it to work. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Because God can see if you're half-hearted about it. He, he, he detects that like that. So it's got to be real. And I promise you, you will resist that temptation. I promise you. If your, heart, if your prayer is sincere, some temptations are harder than others. I get it. God will give you strength. And the devil may bring that back to you five minutes later. And maybe somebody, and you just, you pray, God. Because you think the devil's going to attack me at, at, at uh, taking meth? Well, the devil tempt me at taking meth. Well, you don't know this, but I'm not, I, I've never taken meth. And that's, that's not my deal. That's not my weakness. You think I'm going to take meth? Are you crazy? <laughs> I will not even get near it with a 10-foot pole. But there may be others who had that background, who came from a druggy background, and who were converted. And that may be a soft spot because it's in the psych, and that's what they went through. And the devil may very well tempt them to take meth when they see an old buddy and, hey, dude, hey, man, hey, come on over here. I got something to tell you. You got to be careful. Right? God knows you. The devil knows you. God knows your weak spots. The devil will attack your weak spots. God can help us with our weaknesses. The devil will never leave us alone in those weaknesses. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is the part that bugs us as Christians. We just got to go through this. You know what the Bible calls this? The good fight of faith. It's the battle. The apostles, the prophets all said the same thing. Stick with it. Fight it. Be a good a hero of faith. And Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, He will give you the crown of life. Got to stick with it. Paul said that to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He said, I have fought the good fight. fight. I have finished the course. There is a crown of righteousness awaiting me, and not only me also, but all those who have loved the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. So, walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That's that tension. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That is, you're not trying to be changed and transformed by the law. But the Spirit, um, Titus, now look at the, your lesson. Look at all of those verses there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, letter E, Romans and Galatians, only the Spirit can kill desires, carnal desires and acts. Only the Spirit can do that for you. So read those texts. Um, letter G, the Apostle John stresses rejecting sinful living, being born of God, which is solely through the Spirit, begets a godly life. You see how important the Holy Spirit is? Holy Spirit power. I've always liked this next text that I put for you on the screen. I've always liked this. Um, Paul says in Titus, the grace of God teaches us to say what? No, no to ungodliness and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Well, guess who brings the grace of Christ into our lives? It is the Holy Spirit. Now, last but not least, flip your lesson God's mercy for sinners. Now, I will tell you just up front, and I know you will say, here, here, and agree with me. I experience this tension between good and evil in my heart and, between, and the space between my ears. Do you? You bet you do. If you don't, then you're actually dead. <laughs> Literally dead. Only dead people don't experience this tension. Or spiritually dead people. You see, everything that Paul is saying here is for those who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. By the way, going back to Romans 7, somebody may say, oh, but that's the unconverted Paul speaking in Romans 7. That's why he's having this tension and this struggle, because he's unconverted. Not true. And I'm going to tell you why I don't believe that's true. Because only a converted person is aware of that tension. 
Only a person who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit realizes, oh my goodness, what am I thinking? What am I doing? Oh, I want to do God's will. Only a, a, a converted person experiences those things. An unconverted person, pfft, they just do what they want. I'm not saying they're immoral. They do have morals and they won't do certain crimes and bad things to people. So I'm not saying people outside the church are completely evil and hopeless. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying Paul is speaking as a converted individual in Romans chapter 7. He has an acute awareness of self that is bugging, but it's the truth. It's the truth. That's why we need to be patient and kind towards each other and not pretend that we have it all together and we're perfect little angels compared to those who don't go to church at all. We, you just can't do that. God is smarter than you. He's smarter than that. You're not gonna, we're not going to fool God by thinking like this. So we got to be careful. I'm so glad for this next one. How about you? I'm so glad. Because we are not consistent people. We can be. All of the power there is available. If we succumb to temptation, it ain't God's fault. Not God's fault. Do you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No temptation has seized you that is not common to man. But with every temptation, God will provide a way of escape so that you can stand under it. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So, oh man, no, he's been tempted like me. I can't take this anymore. <laughs> not true. God's mercy for sinners. John says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. What does he say? So that what? You may not sin. He's writing these things. I don't want you to sin because you have the power to resist. But then he says, and if anyone sins, we have an what? Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Give Jesus Christ a big hand here. I'm so glad. Oh, you didn't give Jesus a big hand. Give Jesus a hand. He's our advocate. And so all is not lost. I'm, it's kind of like God is making a provision. He has this contract and everything's written down, everything that we talked about this morning, and then we sign the contract. Well, what happens if you sin? God, what happens if I just sinned? I'm going to ask you, uh, what happens if I sin, God? This is the good news. God doesn't want us to sin in thought or in deed. But if that happens, we got an advocate with Jesus Christ. Yes! The devil can't win anyway. Now, do not misunderstand Paul. That's why you have to read Romans carefully. Grace is not a license to sin. Look at those verses there. God's mercy, not a sanction to sin. Isaiah 59, verse 2, sin is a destroyer, ruining relationships. Primarily, they separate us from God. In Psalm 66, 18, regarding wickedness means deliberately harboring it, and God will not honor a prayer when we do this. Uh, I, love my, I love my corona. Uh, I love my cores. I just, uh, uh, I'm just going to get a quick six-pack. Not going to let any members know. And I'm just going to down a, a pack because I know God is gracious. I know He's loving. He understands that I just got to have this beer and He'll forgive me. And so ooh, you go to the store, you go to Safeway, you get a six pack, and just kind of look around, make sure there's not a member looking around, <laughs> you know, before you exit. <laughs> And then you kind of just like walk like this, keep it at your side, you know. And then you take it home and you just chug one down. Because you know that Christ is going to forgive you anyways. That is wrong thinking for a Christian. Because <laughs> God's grace and his loving mercy towards you, he's not saying, I am so merciful towards you, do what you want, I'll be merciful anyway. That's not how God operates, is it? Come on, is God stupid? <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't fool God and make him out a fool and take advantage of his grace to you. You can't do that. That's not the way it works. So we have to be careful and 
you know, understand these. And you guys are smart. You know what I'm saying is right, right? You guys already figured this out. You know that's true. So I am so thankful. Oh, I did want to read this and we'll close with this. That last quote. I love this quote. On the back side, it's from Ellen White from Steps to Christ. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God. Is that you? Yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Spirit. You ever doubted that before? If you doubted it, you're in good company. It's okay, because that's, that's humans. We may have those doubts. She says, to such I would say, do not draw back in despair. We shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes, but we are not to be discouraged. Even if we are overcome by the enemy, we are not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. No, Christ is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Said the beloved John, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know, when you mess up, when I mess up, and we repent and we're sorry and our, our consciences are just remorseful, you may be tempted to think that, don't even think about it. Don't even think about praying to God. You think God is going to accept you? You think God's happy with you? You think God's going to forgive you? too serious. No deal. God's mad at you. He's disappointed. You are not worthy and deserving enough to pray so that God will hear you. You think God's going to give you the time of day after what you did? You may hear those thoughts. You may think those thoughts. That ain't God talking. That's not God talking. That is our arch enemy talking. Or if you're so used to bashing yourself, and that has become very, very habitual. Satan barely has to tempt you to think that way. That's just who you are. But I'm going to say you have to fight against those things. You have to fight against those thoughts. Because what she's saying is true. We should not sin. We have the power not to sin. But if we do, don't feel that you're rejected by God. God may be disappointed and more so hurt. But it's not like he's turning his back on you. He opens arms, hey, let's just, I'm willing to forgive you. Come to me and let's start all over. Let me get you up and, and dust you off. And let's do this again. Let's do this again. Come on, let's stick with it. Let's stick with it. God is loving. That's what God does. doesn't reject us. That's good news, isn't it? Power is available. And if we don't wield that power and take advantage of it, God can forgive. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Let's sing this song. I'll invite you to stand, and we're going to sing a sweet, sweet spirit. <clears throat>